Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Podcast Pasta. That's a podcast that's like pasta, not the podcast that's about pasta. As always, I'm your host, Mike, and today I'm joined with Darcy Prince. You are the, I guess I would say the host of Knowledge Variable, I believe, is the name of your channel. Uh, you basically create avant-garde kind of um, more abstract films. Uh, you also have a music channel. You run your own pod eh, podcast. Darcy, how are you today? I'm going good. I'm wide awake and I'm looking forward to this. Well, again, thank you so much for coming on. Um, the My lead question that I always like to go with is, I know I gave you a very brief introduction, but um, I, I find that I can never do the justice of people introducing themselves. So I guess... Uh, in your own words, I guess, explain what you do and what motivates the content that you create. Well, like you said, I do a lot of um, avant-garde stuff. Um, it's, it, I guess, mixed media is the formal, more formal term. Um, so what I normally try to offer is, um, like I said, the avant-garde, which is another polite way to say it's a lot of low-budget movies. Um, like I said, I do music as well, which is a complete... I, I, I put it out there as a joke, like mind. Um, I also do my own podcast, which I started during COVID. It was just another way to, to put something out. Um, mainly because it was, I found it hard to find people to do things during that time. I also do self-publish uh, a lot of literature as well, which is ranged from poetry, short stories to contemporary novels, or avant-garde, more style. <coughs> Excuse me. But in terms of that filmmaking stuff, a lot of it's just kind of um, weird ideas. I am a fan of avant-garde filmmaking, um, and anyone who's in the arts who works in it would know what they want to do and what they actually produce can be two different things. And to, to do the means of um, my own work experience, I found it easier in terms of when I produce my own stuff. The avant-garde stuff is a lot more easier, and then I tend to be that's what I'm good at, type stuff. So um, that's me in a nutshell. And um, so one thing that I usually like to do with this show is uh, I kind of call it like closing the gap in terms of like your, your story. So, you know, right now with your YouTube, you create these avant-garde um, films. You do, like I said, the music, the podcasting. But I guess what... I, I guess I want to ask what kind of got you into that? Was it like something that you studied in school? Is this just something that you're exploring as a um, hobby? Um, what what got you into um, doing this, uh, making these type of films? Um, well, you know, like my, I'm assuming like most people, like they've always been a fan of something. Um, and generally when you grow up a little bit, you tend to, tend to be a fan towards one or two things. Um, with me personally, I've always been a fan of movies. Um, I, I don't think most teenage boys or young boys, um, they're into books. And for me, books and literature came in later in life as an adult in my 20s. But I've always been a fan of films and stuff. And growing up, that's something that um, I enjoyed doing and grow all the time. Just to be able to relax and chill out and get my mind off things, I just put movies on and sort of thing. Um, but, you know, growing up, I didn't have um, any dreams or aspirations or anything like that. Um, I don't know why, I just never had. I just thought that I'd end up working some normal job somewhere, which I'm a, uh, I'm a chef by trade. So as a teenager, I, I worked a lot of, in a lot of hospitality-based Areas like restaurant, restaurants and cafes uh, mainly. Cafes in Australia is very big. Um, it's a, there's a big cafe culture here. So growing up, that's what I did. I became a waiter in the kitchen, becoming a chef. I've become a wait, waiter and all that. But anyway, as a young adult, I decided, not decided, but since I had no responsibilities or anything like that, I thought I'll give it a go in my mid twenties and. So, long story, without boring people, I, um, I don't want to come across as giving out a sad story or anything like that, or 
a rags to Richard things, but I had issues in it with addiction from when I was younger. And um, when I came, when I got to really drug, um, drug addiction recovery, um, be able to 12 step rooms and stuff, um, I thought that was a great time to get my life in order and actually make an attempt to do things with my life. Um, since again, like I said, I had no responsibilities, nothing of that sort of nature, no kids, no girlfriend. Um, and the only responsibility that I had was to look after myself. So I thought, may as well give it a go. And it, yeah, since I was 25, um, yeah, I, was, I think I was 25, um, I ended up working in a movie set here in Australia. Um, the movie's called The Scrying, but it's never been released. So it's, I kind of worked on that movie for a month in production. And, um, and just, it was a feature film, um, nothing amounted from that movie, which is normal in filmmaking, but I worked, a, um, I did a lot of on-set production jobs, um, a lot of short films, a lot of music videos, a couple of commercials. Um, yeah, and just built up from that. Originally in film, I thought I was going to, wanted to be a screenwriter, but I wrote a couple of scripts and realised that's not for me. You know, change from screenwriting to film directing because you know in, in movies and stuff, everybody wants to be an actor or a uh, film director or something like that sort of creative output. But um, so in my mid my mid late twenties, I worked a lot on um, um, movies and stuff of that nature, mainly local to Sydney, Australia. Um, a lot of amateur stuff, a lot of film student stuff. Um, I've had a few big hits here in Australia that was filmed locally. Um, probably the biggest one that I kind of, um, biggest ones that I worked on here in Australia were Hacksaw Ridge with Mel Gibson. And um, I did a few things for the, the last Mad Max movie, um, here in it, which had Tom Hardy in it. But other than that, I kind of realised that even though I enjoyed doing that, I enjoyed working on other people's projects, other short films, other feature films. Um, you know, I, I've got no regrets with it. I've got no resentments, nothing. To, I really, really enjoyed it. I started making a living um, as in producing based musicians. Um, I could still do that today if I wanted to. Um, or, you know, finding like a production role somewhere doing something I can make a living out of it. Um, I don't want to speak for other countries, but um, at least because I, I haven't worked in other countries in um, the film industry, so, but here in Australia at least, um, it can be very time consuming um, working on set, working on projects and stuff of that nature. And I kind of knew that later on, like, even though maybe not immediately or, or Maybe it could be years away that I, if I allowed that sort of career path to unfold and follow through on it, um, I realised a lot of life would go past me when I'm just working in film. Um, sometimes on a film set, it's 12, 14, 16 hour days, and you've really got to commit yourself to the project. And even in post and pre productions, um, particularly if I had a producing based role, um, I still had to invite myself to that project. And I didn't want to spend my time working. So I decided to leave, um, not leave, but I decided to focus on my own creative endeavors rather than work, focus on other people's endeavors. Um, I, and that's how I kind of switched from working for other people in film to trying to self create my own sort of stuff. Um, you know, with technology and um, the internet, um, it makes it a lot more easy today to kind of self-produce your own sort of work. Um, you know, cameras were affordable. You can just even get a smartphone and use that video camera on the smartphone as a camera. Um, like I said, with computers and t on one, the online world, it's really easy to get your hands on. Um, you know, computers and laptops are affordable for most people, I'm assuming. Um, and you can download editing software. So I just thought one day, instead of relying to get funding from other people, um, or crowdfund, or trying to build 
build my career up through the traditional format, which is working for other people and build your way up. Um, I bought a couple of cameras. I, sometimes I use my mobile phone, uh, my smartphone, sorry, um, as a camera, and developed a writing, screenwriting style for myself, and um, based on whatever ideas that I had at the time. And through trial and error and experience, I developed a way of filmmaking for myself that works for me, or what I'm good at, and sort out actors and stuff of that nature. So with most things that I, particularly with the, the videos and um, the films that I put on my YouTube channel, I, I do practically everything on that project besides the, the actual acting. So when I got an idea, uh, normally I throw it out, I write it out. I, sometimes it's in the traditional screenwriting format, sometimes it's not. Um, once I'm happy with that sort of writing pace for the film, normally I would seek out uh, an actor or an actress, particularly for that project. And once that's done, I get the scheduling and um, be on set. I film the actual video or movie, what you want to call it, and I put it online and hopefully I can build up from that. So um, I've been doing it for maybe about 10 years um, at the moment. Um, yeah, but only I've tried to focus on the avant-garde films and my own videos at the moment. That's number one in my creative sort of um, profession, if you can say that. Um, but with the literature, what, I, um, what a lot of people work out when you get into filmmaking is how much time there is. It's t like I said, it's time consuming. When you do have a project going on, it, you kind of have to devote your whole sort of day to that or your time to that. When the project's over, there's a bit of space in between, um, from project to project. Um, they help fill out that time. You know, like I said, even though I have a quick process of getting things done, um, I do everything besides the uh, actual actor. So sometimes finding the actor, getting the actress, um, scheduling, waiting for the next shooting date, in between those sort of times, um, I like to do my own creative writing and so the, the t space in between I'll sit down on my uh, on my computer uh, write whether it's poetry short stories or novels and that's to help fill out the time where I'm more kind of well I'm still doing something I'm still being creative and yeah that's pretty much it so sometimes I just focus on poetry sometimes I'll focus on short stories or an actual um, up a novel length piece, I write it out, I put it through Grammarly or with the help with the, or, or another English um, processor. Because you know, when, when I found out, when I read my own stuff, I know what I'm talking about because I was the one who wrote it, but that's not necessarily the case for other people. So another person might read it and it might not make sense, or it's just bad English or bad grammar, which does happen when you write. Um, you know, mistakes happen, you know, is what I'm trying to say. So, hence why I might use like Grammarly or another tool like that to help with my writing. And like I said, with the, with the, um, the computers and the internet being so mainstream and affordable for a lot of people, um, I don't have to wait for a publisher. Um, I have other stuff published. Um, I've had poetry, my, my, my poetry published by other people, I've my short stories published by other people. But with Amazon and Kindle and ebooks, um, it makes it a lot more easy for writers to kind of get their work out. Um, so then, yeah, I predominantly focus on my ebooks. Um, I've had the occasional piece printed out in the hard cup or, or physical copies. That has happened from time to time. And that's how I got into creative, uh, into literature or creative writing, um, is to help produce um, um, help produce content, as you say, or creative works in between my film projects. Um, in regards to the podcast, my own podcast, um, I started doing it from assuming like most people when COVID happened. Um, it's the same sort of ba basis, that it's still something to do. I'm still producing something. Um, as the wall was going during the COVID thing. Um, you know, I, 
it was really hard to create projects when other people didn't want to be out and about. Um, I'm not, I don't really take sides in the whole COVID debate, but a lot of people here locally in Australia, um, they didn't want to deal with dealing with other people. They didn't want to deal with the police, like, what are you doing? What are you doing outside? And all that sort of stuff. So it, it kind of made it a bit harder to kind of create film projects. And I felt really bad that I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to be lazy. I still wanted to do things. So I, I just picked up my phone and started audio recording myself. And I've always been a big fan of Bill Burr. Um, I've always liked his podcasts. Um, and I kind of figured out that that's all he did was just record himself on his phone or into a microphone. And then somehow I uploaded it onto his YouTube channel or online, wherever. And I started doing that. Um, I do like doing it. Um, I do like working on my own, and I do it from time to time. Um, in terms of my music, um, considering I've put a large stuff on YouTube, I like the whole YouTube genres and stuff. I'm a big fan of locales. Um, I don't know why they fascinate me. Um, the, more the, the more the obscure stuff that you find online, I've always liked. Um, the way you can listen to me talk with my accent, deep voice, it's um, it's quite obvious I don't have a singing voice. So I thought as a joke that I'll start self-producing um, satire music. Um, but in terms of the, my musical stuff that I put out there, it is more of a joke. Um, but you know, it's you know, it will give people a bit of fun. You know, what's this guy doing making a song or beatboxing? Um, it's just as a, you know, just a little joke and that sort of stuff. Um, with the, the, the songs, particularly the, the, the music and all that, it's more like an Easter egg sort of thing. Um, you know, I don't know why, but I've got, I know I've got like four or five dedicated fans to my YouTube channel and they've made themselves known to me. So it's just a nice little hidden gem. So if, if I do kind of make it out of uh, the unknowns on mine, if I do, if that's if the key word, um, it's just little Easter eggs people can find throughout that I've put out then into the into the online world, into the wild. So I don't know if that's answered your question or if that's the information you're looking for. Um, um, no, that's that's a very yeah. thorough answer. Um, and I'm and I've kind of realised that I speak really Australians speak kind of fast and they don't speak properly. Um, so I just realised that after I've given my answer to you. No, nah, no, nah, you're. I mean, you're good. Yeah. You're good. Yeah. Um, but I, I kind of want to pull pull it back to a bit of ways, uh, and only if you feel like talking about it. You said that you overcame um, addiction. If you don't mind talking about it, uh, I don't mind talking about it. Yeah. Well, what was the nature of it? Um. It's okay. I did. I, I got my hands on that you know, as a teenager. You know, you get. That's what you want to do. You want to party and have fun and drink and all that sort of stuff. Um, just make a bit of weed and all that. So um, that's how I got into it, sort of thing. Um, I don't want to give up because it, it's not like a sap story and I don't want pity for it. Um, I've actually had a pretty normal life here in, here in Sydney, Australia. It's very white, middle class, white background, sort of thing. So I come from a good family, living in a suburbia and all that sort of stuff so it's not like I came through um, I had a background in, in poverty or anything like that or abuse I went to school you know just had a normal life so I, I, betray, I try to portray myself as somebody who was kind of born with that addiction gene if that makes sense so it's not that it stems from trauma or anything like that so unfortunately for people like me who were born with that addiction gene um, generally you don't find out you experience life so it kind of just started for me as a teenager you know you, on the weekends you want to hang up with your friends or in Australia you call it your boys or your mates somehow you get your hands on um, some cheap alcohol um, and that's what yeah just initially it wasn't a problem for me you know I could I, you know when I was 15 16 it was something that I did every couple of weeks you know um, whether it was beer, bourbon or wine, I would somehow get my hands on it. Um, and then where you came into the pitch, you know, you, you, you want to sit around and smoke weed, and, but you think that's the cool thing. You, 
which I don't blame teenagers for. You know, that's the cool thing. That's what your friends are doing. The, the, the girls are there and all that sort of stuff. So it's, um, that's how it kind of started for me. You know, nobody was a bad influence or any of that. You know, it's, it's all self-inflicted for me. And as I got older, um, here, here in Australia, the, the legal age to drink and to, to buy cigarettes is 18. Um, so when I turned 18, um, I was able to, to walk into the bottle shop, I was walking to the local pubs and clubs and buy my own alcohol. Um, you know, when you get drunk, or when I got drunk, um, everything was a good idea. So with me, when here, pop culture is pretty popular or mainstream or normal here in Australia, being in the pub and um, a lot of pubs have smoking areas, beer gardens or that nature. So being around it all the time drunk, um, that's how I got into smoking cigarettes and stuff, which I still smoke cigarettes and I you know, regret regret picking up that habit ever since. Um, that's how I got into the cigarettes, you know. So now it's weed, cigarettes and alcohol. And um and a little bit shortly after that, um, when you hit the club scene and you know, the the party scene like that, you know, party pills, cocaine, the harder stuff came up, um, came to the picture. So like I said, when you're drunk, everything's a good idea. And um so Getting onto that sort of stuff, um, I, my body got a taste for it. Um, for harder drugs, and essentially from from like party pills to cocaine. Party pills is just the broad range, whether it's ecstasy or MDA, anything of that nature. Um, but as time went on, it went eventuated to needles and that sort of things, and. Like I said, I, I don't come from the background of abuse or anything. My parents are great. It's it's all that sort of stuff. It's very white suburbia, my background. And, um, so for me, I was born with that sort of biological makeup of being prone to addiction. So um, the experience of life, that's when I learned about the addiction. Like I was more prone to been the addictive nature, so it was very easy for me to adapt into um, um, addiction. So, but like I said, it, um, I'm in my mid thirties now, and um, I got clean and sober in my mid twenties. So, my addiction life probably ranged from between twenty uh, between the age of fifteen and to about say my mid twenties. My first AA meeting was at the age of twenty four three months short sort of um, me turning 25. So it was a healthy about a 10 year life. Um, yeah, it's a, I didn't have a, it, with me personally, my rock bottom came over a period of one year. Um, um, it, I did a three or four day bender. Um, um, I can't remember how much money I had at the time, but I had a few hundred. And he used that few hundred on alcohol, drugs, and cigarettes. And I went through like a blackout, and you know, three or four day blackout, which is quite common with people with alcoholism and addiction. And came out of it, realized that I lost three or four days, and um, had a moment of clarity, as they say. And it took me a fair few months to actually follow through and do something about it. It was a very much a soft rock bottom. Um, it stemmed from a moment of clarity to slowly work up the courage to actually do something about my drug use and my drinking. With other people, their rock bottoms are much harder. Um, like I said, I don't want pity for it. It's um, I had it incredibly easy. Um, anyone who finds recovery in their 20s is very blessed. Because the longer you stay out in that sort of lifestyle and world and behaviour, you cause more damage, not only to yourself, but to the outside world. And um, with me, you know, I don't, I'm not against drugs, I'm not against weed, I'm not against drinking, I'm not against um, the, the medical use of it. Um, if you're somebody who can function, like have two, one or two bottles of beer, 
go for it. You know, if weed, if you're somebody who's medically prone to weed helps, go for it. Um, if you've got some sort of really, really healthy self-control over the, the party drugs, it's okay. I, you know, addiction's what I kind of am against, but unfortunately, for a lot of Oh no, I think we, uh, I think we lost you. Uh, I will take this moment to say we here at Podcast Pasta, for legal reasons, do not support um, drug use of any kind. Except for the cool Hi. ones. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But no, no. Um, uh, sorry, I, I think you cut out there for a sec. But um, yeah, congrats on, you know, being on, you know, taking that road on being clean. Uh, before we continue on, speaking of... Uh, no, I shouldn't. I'm sorry. I shouldn't do that. Uh, basically, today's uh, sponsor is Salty Llama. Um, are you tired of lugging around heavy bottles of detergent and dealing with the mess of measuring the right amount? Introducing Salty Llama, the ultra-concentrated, hyperallergenic, and toxins-free laundry detergent strips that are revolutionizing the industry. Their eco-friendly strips are easy to use. Just toss one in with your laundry and you're good to go. With Salty Llama, you can say goodbye to harsh chemical colors and hello to cleaner, greener laundry experience. But it's not just good for the environment, it's good for you and your family. Their hypoallergenic formula is gentle and sensitive skin, making it perfect for babies, kids, and adults with allergies. Don't just take my word for it. Give Salty Llama a try and see the difference for yourself. You'll be amazed at how powerful and effective the detergent strips are. Visit www.saltyllama.com and order yours today. And don't forget to use the code PODCASTPASTA at checkout for a special discount. Again, that's www.saltyllama.com. Codes podcast pasta, all one word. It's all cap. I don't know if their website really checks. Um, but uh, yeah, Darcy, uh, you 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 cut out with your audio there, so I don't know if there's anything else you want to end with that. Uh, can you hear me now? Or? Yeah, yeah, you're good now. Yeah. Okay. I, since you asked me just the, the addiction stuff, I thought it um, just take a moment to encourage people to kind of. There's no shame, guilt, or remorse about cleaning up the art. Um, if anyone happens to listen to this, is a fu either, even if functional or a complete junkie, please seek professional help. I'm sure your local community has that sort of stuff. And for family and friends that do know somebody in active addiction or alcoholism, um, again, please look after yourself. Um, there are support groups for family and friends and seek out professional advice and feedback before undertaking your own sort of help. And I do encourage anyone to kind of look into it for themselves and stuff. So for any active addicts or alcoholics, please, for your, for your own self-respect and dignity, seek out help. And for friends and family, there are support groups for yourself as well. So I thought I'd just add that in before we continue. So, um, you mentioned earlier how uh, it was when you were talking about your music, how you were into like the whole like lo lol cow, uh, sorry, lol cow like subculture thing. And for my listeners who don't know, um, lol cow, the best way I could describe it is like it's kind of like its own subculture. People that like, so I guess put it lightly, weirdly obsess over like everyday people to like kind of like a celebrity status. I have my own, um, I guess, how would you say, uh, reservations against it. Um, I think even outside the whole morality of it, I, I think like, I don't know, to me, it just kind of seems weird. I don't even like it with, um, you know, being like a TV and movie guy, I don't even like it with like big celebrities. So I think like doing something like that, even with like, you know, regular people or what, you know, we would consider as a bait like regular people um seems weird but i i guess um for you uh I, I think i noticed like some posts on facebook it said like not only just like you being into locales but you said you kind of wanted to like be one if i'm mistaken or am i am i misconstruing your words i uh, no, you're not um which is a fair point to po point out um look I, i'm a big fan of king Cobra. um I understand the criticism towards all of it. Um, unfortunately, there's always going to be those kind of people that will troll or misuse locales, I guess. Um, for me personally, I've always been a big fan of um, like watching documentaries about locales and 
things of that nature. For me, I guess I, I do, which it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, but I pretty much just watch documentaries about them that pe- other people have made about them. Um, I'm just mainly a fan of uh, King Cobra, JFS. Um, the, the other ones, it's just more, I can take it away, but but generally it's just watching the videos or watching documentaries about them. I can, that's just as far as my, um, me being a fan goes. Um, but fortunately, they do suffer a lot of trolling, um, which I'm not a big supporter of. In terms of me um, um, putting myself in the market, it's always been, the, I guess, a, a very um, backseat dream or want. That <laughs> I, I, I was watching one of these documentaries about uh, King Cobra JFS, and um, I caught myself saying to myself that, um, Imagine if somebody did this to me, like made a documentary about my YouTube chat videos and stuff. Oh, uh, so that was that was just the extent of it. Was you like just um, wanting to like kind of oh, yeah. have somebody observe your work in that way? Yeah, and it just it was kind of like more of a self-imposed satire on myself. Just imagine if I um, one day somebody made a little documentary about my vlogs or my avant-garde films and stuff of that nature so it's just yeah it's just a self-satire sort of things and stuff so well if i was better at um you know video essay writing i, I would take up the mantle of that but um, unfortunately i i hate proofreading my own writing i've <laughs> gone on record several times to say that yeah. um but I, I think for your, like yourself, um, with the work that you do, especially with the vlogging, that um, that I, I personally okay. So, from my understanding, like I don't know how much you follow like the blo- the vlogging sphere on YouTube. Admittedly, I don't follow it a lot either. But like the big name, or like I think the biggest name is like Casey Neistat. You know, highly like polished videos. He went to like. Mm-hmm. Uh, film school in like New York and stuff like that. He did like a documentary on how like um, phone batteries aren't really like recyclable. I heard it's interesting. I haven't seen it. Um, but I, I think I guess what I like about your style is it's kind of this like return to tradition, I would say, in that it, it kind of takes it back to, I guess for lack of a term, like it's kind of like grungy nature before like it was like this overly produced like business it was just people wanting to express their lives through you know you know the the best way that they can through like you know their own cameras and very basic setups um i I guess did you have any draw to like any other like vlog scene like that or what was the what was the push for you uh well like i said uh in terms of actually me being a fan of other people's works, um, I don't. I like Casey Neistat. I, I, there's very few people that um, I'm a big. I, I would call myself, consider myself as a fan towards. Um, in terms of the the the, the overly, overly produced stuff, um, yeah, look, I get it. I get why people do it. I get why other people like that sort of stuff. There's always going to be a mainstream somewhere. Um, so. I'm not surprised that YouTube itself has a, their own sort of mainstream people. Um, I, I don't want to come across as me putting anyone down. I get it. I understand. Um, I, now, 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 I always struggle to pronounce his last name, but um, he's probably the most mainstream one that I'm probably a fan of. Um, maybe because the background of filmmaking and the way he produces it, puts his vlogs out, he reminds me of um, actual cinematic styles of filmmaking that I'm a fan of, um, which can be direct cinema, or cinema realism, or slow cinema. They are film genres, um, and because of his filmmaking skills, that's what I like. Um, like I said, from word go, I'm a big movie buff, I, like, I love my movies with all my heart. So. Which I'm more prone to liking his vlogs. Um, in terms of um, other people stuff, um, 
I don't know why, but the, particularly towards, um, I guess, the everyday person making their own YouTube videos, I've always just been more of a fan of realistic stuff rather than um, the more grounded people. Maybe it's my mid, my, my mid, like I'm in my mid thirties at the moment, so it's maybe because of my own sort of maturity, um, life experience, and st things of that nature. Um, and it, you know, this is not a knock to young people. Um, it's just maybe when you go through life a bit more, you kind of have more of a prone towards more genuine people, life experience, and real realistic stuff. So. A lot of people that are that I like listening to um, generally make uh, more very very basic YouTube videos, and they just a lot of them just turn their camera to record and just talk to their camera. Um, I try to base myself what I'm interested in as in a more more of a adult sort of thing, if that makes sense. Subjects and like, there could be a day where I just want to sit and listen to political stuff and. I generally find um, people who just talk about political stuff in that moment. Some days I'm not in the mood, it's, it's too much for me, and I just tend to more um, go towards comedy based content. Um, I know, um, probably, like, I'm a big fan of Bill Burr and um, Tim Dillon. Um, so they're probably the most uh, polished people that I'll listen to as well, the comedy based stuff. Um, the occasional Joe Rogan clip, Joey Diaz, things of that nature. Um, in terms of me, what I draw from, um, in terms of making my own sort of um, um, blogs, I guess. A while ago, I, um, I randomly stumbled on this documentary called TV Junkie. Um, and it's about this journalist um, called Rick Kirkman. He's more modern. He's, he's a, had a very successful career as a journalist. Um, you can YouTube him, you, you find him interviewing presidents and a lot of other people. He worked for a lot of networks. And probably his most recent success in his own professional career. Um, I think he produced a lot of stuff for that Tiger King guy for his website and videos and things like that. Not the Tiger King is whatever he did with him. But I found a documentary that he, um, that he did, um, not, not that he did, but he, um, he collected, um, you know, this is going way back in the 90s and stuff, he had like a VHS home, home video sort of tape and self-recorded a lot of stuff. Um, I guess he was well, from the 90s, you can say, and um, somebody put it together as a documentary, and, um, and the, you know, this is all, I watched this, which is, Sorry, um, let me um, go back. Um, so the documentary he that was done was a collection of his VHS recordings from the 90s and stuff. And this was, um, w which was called TV Junkie. Um, um, and it's very much a grounded, just raw sort of take on blogging from the 90s, I guess. Just turn the camera on and just do whatever. Um, and this was kind of like running in the line of me personally discovering um, like locales and King Cobra, JFS and things of that nature through other people doing video essays about them. And um, now kind of because of my background in filmmaking as well, I found it a lot more easy to kind of have more, I guess, um, filmmaking way of looking at it. Um, I think blogging is going to be more of a modern contribution to um, filmmaking as an art form. Um, I do know a lot about filmmaking history. Um, blogging actually gets um, compared to a lot of um, um, uh, the French New Wave. And just briefly, the French New Wave was um, uh, uh, a new wave of filmmaking back in the 60s from, the, from France, where handheld cameras and um, like eight millimeter footage and stuff of that nature became more affordable and cheaper to the public, um, and that took filmmaking away from this, you know the the studio system, which is another way to, to say corporate uh, filmmaking. Um, well, corporate filmmaking still um, is very much alive today with the Marvel and superhero stuff, and it's very easy to see. Um, but the French New Wave 
gave more film students um, more access or more of an entry point to um, filmmaking back in the in the 1960s and blogging today is compared to that because we've all got access to a webcam we've all got access to a smartphone and made it a lot more easy to kind of for, for everyday people to kind of get into something like filmmaking um, or and but in turn it's more they're more prone to blogging, which is the more modern day of filmmaking. Like, because I, professionally for me, I've always been exposed to um, the cinema, so I try to kind of come to my own sort of blogging um, with my way of my style. And unfortunately for most artists, you don't know what you're actually good at until you actually start trying to trade an art or practice your art form. And unfortunately with for me, whether it's good or bad, whether it's people's tastes or not, that sort of style of grungy look, like you just said, um, was something that I, I can do pretty good and do it really long. And even though my, my vlogs run from like an hour to two hours to three, five hour longs, um, I'll explain in a sec where I got that um, idea to do it that long. I try to do it through more of a documentary based. Um, and like I said, when I discovered JFK Loka, um, <laughs> sorry, um, King Cobra JFS, um, the, the guy that I um, um, discovered him through is through a YouTube channel called Mr. Snowflake. Um, I like his documentaries uh, about internet personalities and stuff of that nature. He made a comment that one thing he liked about King Cobra was it seemed more everyday stuff. Like he would film more everyday things or a lot of um, mundane, a lot of space in between. And they kind of gave me the idea, and while I had watched that um, TV junkie documentary, where a lot of his that documentaries, like his day-to-day -day sort of life, and where, what I liked about every day, like, like I said, maybe it's my maturity or life experience or have a more of a nap or more towards like actual genuine people. That gave me the idea to do more of a day-to-day -day sort of stuff. Like, you know, do long takes of um, me drinking coffee or smoking a cigarette or going to um, shopping or just driving around or that sort of stuff to do that. Because I thought it was something a bit different from what other people will be doing on YouTube, where they try to amplify themselves or to be really produced. Um, like I said, I get it, I get why people do it, but that's something that if I tried to do it myself, it, it would seem phony and fake. Um, even though I'm not poor, um, I don't, I'm not struggling for money, I don't have a lavish lifestyle at all. I don't have access to money where I can get up and go, where a lot of people do. Um, there's a lot of um, travel vlogs and where people can, can afford to get up and go, and I'm not like that. So more of living in a very day-to-day -day suburban life is something that I'm actually doing daily. I actually wanted to ask you because uh, in the background of this interview, I'm playing um, your uh, your short film screen tests, which um, for for you know, it's obviously just footage of like uh, of a camera pointed at an actress for like an hour and a half. Um, it kind of reminds me of. Um, uh, you, you might know the name of this person. It was an artist that created, I think it was like a six hour movie of like footage of just like the Empire State Building, I think, like the top of it. Um, but for a uh, screen test, uh, I wanted to ask, let me just make sure I still have you on here. Oh, I'm not sure if I still have him connected. Let me... Uh, let me check on him and I'll get right back to you all. Stay tuned for more podcast pasta. Okay, and we are back. Sorry for the technical difficulties, but uh, Darcy, I'm not sure if, if sure how much you heard of my question before you left, but I was asking about your uh, short film uh, screen test, you know, basically the footage of um, a camera just aimed directly at an actress for about an hour and a half. I said it reminded me of... Um, an artist whose name keeps eluding me, uh, he made a six hour movie recording of um, the Empire State Building. 
And so I, I guess I want to ask, um, what what difficulties were in coordinating that? Because I, I imagine, like at least from the actor's perspective, that must be kind of a well. To me, I think it would be more difficult, like role, like having like kind of eyes on you for that long without like any specific direction. Um, that particular project. Um, full disclosure. Um, if you pay attention to the to the actual um that particular movie. Um, it's actually a 20 minute clip that I just ended up repeating to about an hour and a half. Um, and the, that's just me getting the system, as you can say. Like I said, the basis and just put that sort of an hour and a half viewing of a person up online. Um, and the original idea I did get from Andy Warhol, which was the, the guy you. Um, Empire State building for six or eight hours. It is Andy Warhol. Yeah. Yeah, Andy Warhol. Oh, which is, okay. His filmmaking um, career is um, almost unknown compared to his pop art. But the basis of that idea, which I don't think a lot of filmmakers or modern artists have, have grasped so far, the, the uses of video, and the basis of that sort of Portrait. Instead of doing paintings or a, a, like a photo, it's just allowing the camera to run on that particular person uh, for a, a period of time. That makes sense. And um, yeah, was it was it difficult for the actress to do it? Because I imagine yeah. like kind of being left to hang. It, it would be like me. I guess for the quill, it'd be like me doing an interview, but like not giving you a question. I guess it would be like the equivalent, if, if you understand what I'm saying. I, uh, yeah, I get it. Um, generally, um, it would have been. Um, like it's something you, you when you realize um, and you actually get into filmmaking. Um, when you're on camera, 10 seconds of being on camera feels like a minute, if that makes sense. Um, and, you know, being on, a minute on camera feels like five minutes. So the person has to kind of mentally and mostly prepare themselves for that. Um, I mean, how I approached that was to kind of relax, do whatever. It would have been an opportunity for a particular person to, to just to relax and just to have a few minutes themselves. And I just happen to film it as they do doing that. But generally, you've got to depending on the actor or the actress, um, Generally, um, from that time and space to do whatever they, they want to make it easy for them. If they smoke cigarettes, they smoke cigarettes. If they want to be on their phone, they want they can be on their phone. So, generally, whoever's doing the actual portrait, in the actual portrait. But fortunately, I do think it's best if you allow them that time and space to do whatever on camera, as long as you kind of put that whatever part to it. That makes sense. Yeah, and that was it. Just basically have them just relax and just try and be yeah. as natural as they can be. Yes, as natural as they can be. Like I said, Andy Warhol got, he's done it a lot of, to, um, his idea, I learned about this in a documentary I watched about him, or particularly about his filmmaking, was to take the idea of portrait paintings and put it on film. So, you know, anyone can has access to this. Um, on like, a lot of his screen tests are, um, are free and available on on YouTube or online. Um, and what he normally did was he had like a background and a and a stool and a and a camera pointed to that direction. He told the person to sit on the camera, uh, sit on the chair, and with the camera on. And Andy Warhol would go, "I'll be back in a moment." Up, leave the room and be gone for an indefinite amount of time. And the camera would be recording that particular person and would, you know, on purpose, film there and just sitting on that chair for a period of time. And he's done a lot of people. I think he's done Dennis Hopper, the actor, Bob Dylan, the, um, the, the famous musician. And he's done it to a lot of other people also. For a lot of people listening to this, all, all you got to do is go into YouTube and type in Andy Warhol screen test and 
get more of a polished or better example of that sort of style of filmmaking. That's where I got the idea. Um, look, I love photos, I love paintings, but video, something about video, it's more of an in-depth um, capturing of that particular person. So that's where I got the idea for that screen. So unfortunately, sometimes finding people to do that on the camera is so harder than actually actually doing the actual art phase. In browsing your filmography, uh, you know, unfortunately, I didn't have the time to like watch everything before we um, held this. We had this interview, but um, I, I I couldn't tell. Are there some of your works though that do involve some type of narrative, or is it mostly kind of this like I guess you would say like still life um, filming, where it's just it's just like capturing day to day life. There is, um, um, I got a lot of videos about capturing still life. Um, before I move on to um, other edges and stuff, um, I've, just, I've put out lots of videos of me just filming random objects, um, household items. Um, whether it's a minute or 10 minutes or 20 minutes. Um, and it's just to work off that basic idea. Instead of painting something, drawing something, a photo or something, I'll you know, video it. That's what the, the narrative um, going on from that sort of um, art piece. Um, uh, when you're doing something creatively or artistically, you've really got to find what works for you, um, what you're good at, what you can do all the time, and, and you know, mostly enjoy and all that sort of stuff. And part of that process is to take some time out and listen to other people in that field of work. To me, it's filmmaking, so maybe not as much now as I shouldn't be doing, but particularly when I was starting out, um, working, producing for other people, learning about filmmaking, and when I started trying to do my own sort of films, I put some time out to, to listen to, to um, interviews from film directors, um, interview, interviews from screenwriting, interviews from people who do set designs, and trying to learn and learn and learn. Um, and that was my sort of version of was to watch documentaries about filmmaking. In a, and this is a filmmaker, um, which I do recommend to people, was um, a bloke called Harmony Corrine. Corrine, as you can say. His most famous film is uh, Spring Breakers with James Franco in it, uh, Selena Gomez. It's one of my favourite film is um, one thing I like about him as a film director is that um, each movie that he's done is different from one another. But like I said, Spring Break is his, his most especially, uh, successful film. That's a very different from the movie he did before and the movie he did after. Um, a lot of um, earlier work particularly was, um, I put it, uh, a um, very low budget, very art house. Um, like I said, direct cinema, slow cinema, or realistic cinema. Um, like this, it's a very different style of filmmaking. Mainstream. Um, so I was listening to one of his video. Um, sorry, I was listening to one of his interviews and asked about his earlier work. Um, and he his answer was, he watches movies. He doesn't only remember the story, but he'll remember certain points or certain scenes or certain clips or certain moments of his little watch. That's what he tries to do, it's just to capture moments on video and he'll get it all together. But I started writing my own sort of scripts or do my own sort of movie making. That's what I try to do. I'll write like a bullet point on paper. I, I might go actor one takes a ball around only that's what I'd write when we get to the set was just to um, the actor or actress who I forgot for that film set take the ball around and I'll just film it that's how I try to do my own sort of movies when I'm on set filming so 
I'll give the, act, the actor basic instructions, basic directions, very basic, no little. I'll just show film what I capture on camera. 28% of what I actually capture on camera, I generally put out there. Um, I'll put it in the, in the, in the completed works, as you can say. And just edit all the, the footage that I've got of that particular film project it out there. So that's how I generally do my own sort of filmmaking. I get basic ideas, um, try to write it out. Um, might not be so sort of narrative to it, but um, that's something I, I personally enjoy doing, and that seems to be what I'm good at in terms of my own sort of filmmaking. Get a basic idea, write a few things, the actor to go, and ever generally um, I capture on camera. Like I said, 96, 98 percent of the time, I'll use that footage and edit it. In the editing process, I might fix up the color. I might put some film grain on it, uh, dusting, stabilize the actual footage. And sometimes I put music to it, or sound effects to it, or the uh, HX static sound to it, which I generally use most of the time. sound. That's how I try to build my own sort of post my vlogs and actually try to make a film piece for an actor or an actress. Normally that's how I try to make the movies, try to find just everyday life or mundane or raw life or things that wouldn't normally kind of um, take it to a, an actual cinema. Now I try to use that sort of stuff in my own sort of movies. Al, um, the, the, the famous British film director Alfred Hitchcock one of his most famous quotes he said about movie making drama is life but taking the boring bits out in it in the movie. I, I try to take, use the reverse of that, try to find the boring parts of life and that in a movie and take the highlights out. It kind of coincides to, to what I like to watch and you and to what, to what I like to, what, what videos I like to watch and what movies I like to watch. It's just all the grounded reality based sort of art for that. So, as is any artist or anyone get into the creative or, in, or into the entertainment industry, is do what you like, do what you're interested in. So, it's just not bad advice, but you just got to find what you could add to. So, I don't know if that answers your questions, but <laughs> hopefully it's good enough. Um, in the broadest strokes, I believe you did. Um, unfortunately, we are approaching um, the hour mark. So um, for my listeners tuning in, thank you so much for joining us today. If you want to support the podcast, you could do so in a number of different ways. Uh, if you want to support on a monthly basis, I recommend my Patreon account. There's three different tiers. Uh, with all the tiers, you get your name run aloud in the credit section here, but unfortunately, I don't have any patrons, so the section is blank. Uh, if you want to do a one-time donation, like you don't want to really feel you know compelled to donate monthly, I also have a Ko-Fi account for one you know for single-time donations. They also let you do monthly but again i would recommend the patreon more for that because you do get more of the tier rewards with that um i also have a merch store with uh, merchandise um, um with logos designed by nocturnal essen george isaac of nocturnal essen i also did uh got a recent piece commissioned from um oh, i wish i had his name but i i i've lost the notes for that but anyways, merch store, you can buy t-shirts, mugs, what have you, stickers. Um, all of this is linked on my X account, not Twitter account. Thanks, Elon. <laughs> my X account, at, uh, it's in a link tree in my um, bio. Uh, Darcy, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you want to shout out where people can find uh, you and your work. Okay, so Facebook and uh, YouTube. Uh, you should predominantly, if you had to make a choice, is type in knowledge variable or Darcy Print. Instagram is just Darcy Print. That's where people can find me. My literature and, and stuff is stems from my YouTube channel too. So YouTube knowledge variable.
All right, and I'll try and provide the links to all that in the episode descriptions. Um, but once again, thank you all so much. Thank you to Salty Llama for sponsoring the episode. Again, the uh, website is www.saltylama.com. Promo code podcast pasta. You'll get ten percent off your order. It also helps the channel. Um, but yeah, uh, take care, everyone. Bye. Pleasure. Thank you for having me.